Hey, I'm John Gordon with Positive University, and I'm here with Michael Lombardi. Michael, you just wrote a book called Gridiron Genius. Talk about that book, and why did you write it? You know, John, it was a, it was uh, kind of something I thought of when I was working for the Raiders in 2007. You know, I've been blessed to work for the great Bill Walsh. I started out my career with him. I was blessed to work with Bill Belichick early in his career. And then, of course, Al Davis. And I thought, you know, very few people have been to the Super Bowls with all three guys. Perhaps it's time for me to put down on paper what I've learned from all of them. You know, and that's what I decided to do. And so it started in 07 with that idea and it's really germinated more when I went to New England to, to reunite with Belichick and win two Super Bowls with him. And then I thought, you know, the time's perfect for me to share some of this uh, learning that I've gotten through through my over 30 years in the NFL with other people. I think it's different from what most people might suspect of the NFL. Everybody thinks it's just a sport with a whistle, you know, but it's a very, it's, it's a business. And I wanted to show people in this book that football is a business. It's also about leadership. And before we talk about Belichick, let's talk about the Browns. I know you were the GM there for a year, also worked with the organization in, in, a, in a very large leadership capacity for, for a number of years. What is wrong with the Browns from a culture perspective, from an organizational perspective, and why can't they just seem to get it right? And also, are they now getting it right with Baker Mayfield and where they're going? Well, I think this, I think, you know, Bill Walsh told me this in, in 1984. I was running around the draft room like a chicken without a head. And he says, what are you panicked about? And I said, well, you know, the Falcons did this. And, and he said, look, Michael, we're only competing against eight teams here. And at the time, John, I didn't know what he was talking about. I thought it was the talking about quarterbacks and coaches. And what he was talking about was culture. That he told me then that only eight owners were willing to allow a culture to come into their building that they really were – there was some teams might win one year, lose the next, but for the baseline of performance of, of consistency, cultures weren't there. So when you look at Cleveland with Jimmy Haslam, spent time with the Pittsburgh Steelers, one of the culture-based organizations in the NFL, they're always one of the eight, okay? And yet Jimmy never learned what culture, how to make a culture. He's always about – well, if I got a better coach or if I had a better tight end or if I had a better offensive guard, when he doesn't want to establish the culture, he's, and I'm using his terms here, he wants a collaborative effort. And I don't know, you know, you've spent a lot of time around great teams and great leaders. Collaboration doesn't build culture. A leader builds a culture. But doesn't a leader need to collaborate with their team in order to build the culture? Correct. But you got to give somebody the authority to have that ability to establish the culture. And I would tell Jimmy my one year in Cleveland, look, you set the parameters for what you want. Tell me what kind of organization you want to have and then allow us to build it. You know, but it doesn't work if you're line hiding and vetoing things that, that go on. You don't want players that have off the field issues or you do. You know, just define the role of what your organization is and then we can build it. But in terms of who sets the culture, the head coach has to set the culture. It can't come from a general manager. It can't come from a player personnel director. It has to come from the guy talking to the team every single day who's not only installing the culture, but making sure it's maintained on a daily basis. Was you Jackson the right guy to create the culture there? No, Hugh was all about my offense. Hugh was about himself. Hugh was never about building culture. Hugh was always about – you know, what can I do? And, and if you're trying to build a culture, you can lose because you know there's, the score is going to take care of itself, like Coach Walsh said. But the reality of it is, is Hugh didn't understand culture because everything in Cleveland was subcontractors. It was collaboration. Greg Williams runs the defense. You know, Todd Haley runs the offense. You know, the special teams coach runs the special teams. That doesn't exist in New England. There's one leader who's, who's building the culture there, and then everybody works for him, and they collaborate together from that point. Hugh Jackson, you were very vocal as a, as a critic of him as a leader and the mistakes he was making as a coach as well. Did they make the right decision by getting rid of him right now? And what does that say about the culture when you fire someone midseason? Yeah, it says you have no culture, right? You have none. And, and so now they're trying to win games and they're not even trying to establish a culture. I think the decision, look, they fired Hugh because he wasn't collaborative. It wasn't because of his one loss record. But the reality of it is, is when you got done the season last year, they had no culture. Jimmy's owned the team since 2013. He's yet to allow a culture to be brought into the building. He's asked the trainer about what we should do with players in their training. That's not, that 
subcontracts the culture. They're, the culture should be maintained through one guy. The trainer's job is to enact what the culture instills, not for him to decide the culture. So when you have a subcontracting organization, you have no chance to win. Do the Ravens do it right? The Ravens? I think the Ravens can do it right. I think John has the, the foundation and the structure to run the organization. I think Steve Bashotti understands that. But I think there's been some decisions in terms of their own evaluation that I think haven't been correct. I think they have Joe Flacco, who's really a not a West Coast offense quarterback, and they're trying to make him into one. And when he really had his best success with Gary Kubiak as a play-action quarterback, the Ravens are 29th in the NFL in rushing, passing in the first, in the first half. They try to run the throw the ball instead of trying to establish what, what Flacco can do, which is play action pass. So I follow you on Twitter and your tweets are brilliant. You just share such great insights about teams, about games. You have such comprehensive knowledge about every aspect. Why is there so little knowledge in these organizations, these you know, billion dollar organizations and they're run so poorly? What is going on here? Mike? Because coaches have been trained poorly. Look, this, let's take Sean Payton and, Bill, and, and John Gruden, for example. John Gruden spent very little time with Mike Holmgren, became the offense coordinator at a very early age. He hired Sean Payton. Sean Payton came in as a young coach, really had no office, John. He was working out of a suitcase. He was working out of a briefcase with a cell phone, okay? That was his office. But, but Payton went on to work for Bill Parcells. And those two years working for Parcells, he, was, he learned how to become a head coach. He's way different as a leader today because of the relationship. What the NFL today has become is a subcontractor league. And you say, why is that? Because it helps people who don't have any knowledge about football stay involved in football. So when you subcontract everything out, you don't have to be the authority on everything. You can be the decision maker on everything, but you're not the authority on everything. That's why it's so bad. Game management is atrocious. There's the teams make last yesterday, for example, Vance Joseph makes the classic mistake that every coach makes. We're going to get the ball in the field goal range. He had 42 seconds left to go in the game with a timeout. He throws a five-yard pass and eats up 30 seconds. So he exchanged five yards for 30 seconds, and he attempts a 51-yarder. Everybody leaves the stadium saying, well, you know, Brandon McManus missed that kick. Isn't that horrible, right? No. What was horrible was we have to get the ball into field goal make range, not field goal attempt range. That little difference is huge. Vance Joseph obviously has never learned that before. He just was, okay, we'll kick the field goal 51 yards. We're in altitude, no big deal. Those things happen all the time, John. So what is the solution then to develop better leaders within the NFL and in, ter and in terms of all organizations, really? I, I think there should be some more time spent learning. I think there should be more spent time training. I think the NFL has made a huge mistake in terms of allowing guys – we're moving up the ladder. Remember, we're in a profession that is elected, not selected. So when you're electable, sometimes you get into office without credentials and you're not prepared for it. Kissinger says in his memoirs, when you go to Washington, you borrow on the intellectual power you bring and you can't renew it once you're there. When you become a head coach, it's very difficult to renew your intellectual power. And if you're not prepared for it, like so many of these guys aren't prepared for it, they, they can't succeed. We should have a more comprehensive training program of how to be a head coach. Belichick spent so many years working for Parcells, studying Joe Gibbs, how he was going to become a head coach, learning it when a head coach was truly a head coach in control of everything. Today's head coaches are subcontractors. I mean, listen, look, you look at the Bears, and I think Matt Nagy has a chance to be a good coach, but he spends so much time looking at his call, she doesn't even know what's going on on the field. How can you be a leader if you don't know everything? So you're saying that a coach should not be a coordinator and a head coach at the same time? I think it's a very challenging job. Yes, I do. I think he, the head coach should see the game at 35,000 feet. I think John Gruden's a perfect example. John Gruden started out as an offensive coordinator. When he became the head coach of the Raiders, he really was just the offensive coordinator. He had a defense coordinator, and Al Davis kind of ran the defense. He wasn't in charge of player personnel. Al Davis ran that. So his focus was solely on the offense, and everything else kind of took care of itself. Now he's the leader of the team. Don't talk, I don't want to talk about how much money he makes. I think that's absurd. He's in charge of a $2 billion industry. To pay him $10 million a year is actually low fee, okay? That's not even, that's not even adequate compensation for a $2 billion a year guy. What, what's the problem is he's looking at his job as he's still the offensive coordinator instead of being the head global coach and the leader of everybody. He needs to have his impact 
on every aspect of the team. He named Bruce Irvin the captain and cut him. How many leaders cut their captains nine weeks into the season? Think about that, John. You're picking the wrong guy to be your leader if you're cutting him nine weeks into the season. That's on you. That's not on Bruce Irvin. He hasn't changed. He's the same guy. So what John has to do is take a step back and see it from a, a, a unilateral aspect and evaluate coaches, evaluate players, evaluate staff, and make sure they're building the things that he wants them to build. In the sales world, they'll take a sales person who's very successful and make that person a sales manager, but that person knows nothing about leadership. In the football world, we take good coordinators and make them head coaches, right. but they don't make great head coaches. Have you noticed that there's a difference between a coordinator and a head coach and what should teams be doing and how do they find their, the right leader? Well, I think that, okay, so I was fortunate enough to write this book about in 1996, the Rams asked me to do a project on leadership and I, and find a great coach. And I broke it down to four areas of leadership, which I write about in the book. And instead of searching for a play caller, Instead of searching, they need to search for a leader. And a leader can bring a culture. Like, let's take Dabo Sweeney, for example. I know you're friends with Dabo. Dabo, would, <laughs> could Dabo coach in the NFL? People would say, no, he's a college coach. Dabo would be a hit in the NFL because Dabo's a culture builder. Dabo builds culture. Dabo doesn't build. He builds. He understands how to unify an organization, make everybody work. He sees the big picture. He can evaluate. This is what we're missing. College coaches can build programs, but they have to stay on top of the game. And I think in the NFL, we become such subcontractors that we don't understand the whole thing and, and they don't know how to lead. And so they don't, they don't, they can't, they don't meet with the team on a daily basis. They don't have a message to the team on a daily basis. And so they can't play complimentary football. They can't play, okay, the offense needs to do this this week and the defense needs to do this and together we can win the game. Everybody is operating, okay, the offense has to do this, and, and there's no unification. One guy has to do that, and that's a hard job. Well, let's talk about Belichick. What makes him such a great leader and so successful? Okay, so Belichick, if the running back coach didn't show up this morning, Belichick could go coach the running game, okay? If the special teams coach didn't show up, he'd do that. He, he's the best coach on the staff at any position. He could call the offensive game. He, he knows every detail that's going on in the program. He spends time. I have a five question. I should send it to you. I will send it to you. I was making fun of Hugh Jackson. And I said, the only way Hugh should maintain his job as a head coach is to answer these five questions that I would give to him. Belichick is probably one of the few coaches in the league that can, I know he can answer all five questions because I learned it from him. I mean, these aren't mine. So he understands who the L4 is on the opponent's kickoff team. He knows the strengths, the weaknesses. He meets every – today at 1.30 or tomorrow at 1.30, he'll meet with Tom Brady to go over every defensive back on the Tennessee Titans that he's written up himself. He's involved in every aspect of the organization. Nothing goes on in that building that he doesn't approve and it isn't within the direction of the culture. That's so important. That's vitally important. And so he, he's working at his craft. He's also the general manager of the team. So he spends time on player personnel. His time management is what allows him to be so successful. And then his attention to detail. I have a quote in there by Marcus Aurelius, the secret to all victory lies in the organization of the non-obvious. Belichick is constantly working on the non-obvious. He understands the keys to football. You say his team isn't very good on defense. Okay, but they're great in two-minute defense. They're really good in the red zone defense. All the situational parts of the defense, they're good at. That matters. That's the non-obvious to most of the fans. So I think that's what makes him so effective. And then he takes that knowledge and he tell, talks to the team and educates the team on how we're going to win the game today. How are we going to play this game to win? Is he smarter than the other coaches? You know, Einstein has five levels of intelligence, okay? And the first one is smart, and the, and the fourth one is genius, right? The first one is simple. Belichick's just really simple. He doesn't try to complicate it. If I've heard him say, look, it's not that complicated, once I've heard him say it a million times. He simplifies everything down to the basic element. For example, if he were to play the Atlanta Falcons, would he put his best corner on Julio Jones? No. He would put his second best corner and double Julio Jones and leave his best corner on their second best receiver to gain an advantage. Fairly simple, right? But not everybody does it. But that's Belichick. He boils it down to the simplest forms and focuses. If you want to run the ball, every team has tendencies, right? If you want to run the ball to the right, wouldn't he put his best defensive end to the offense's right, the defense's left? That's what Belichick does. 
He met, he wants you to determine who he is. He simplifies it for you. That's what he did last night. Example, Byron Bell, the right guard for the Packers, not a very good pass protector. Who was over most of the game? Trey Flowers, his best pass rusher. Was that an accident, John? No, that was prepared. That was, that was because they studied the tape, they saw the weaknesses, they put their best against their weak, and they won. So it sounds like he prepares, he focuses on the little things, and then creates a comprehensive game plan with everyone on the team in the organization while still taking zoom focus actions that need to be done. No doubt. So Monday, so Wednesday morning at eight o'clock, he will walk into the team meeting. That team meeting will last an hour. Most head coaches in the NFL don't even meet with their teams. They meet with one element of their team. That meeting will last an hour and he will tell the team what they're going to have to do in preparation in, in their study and in their practice to beat the Tennessee Titans. And those details will be as, as comprehensive as when we played Super Bowl 49 or Super Bowl 51. There's no skipping on it. It's a new week. We start over again. Wednesday week, here's what we're going to have to do to win this game this week, and nothing else gets in the way. So a lot of times other coaches will leave Belichick after being an assistant for years, and they know all these things, and yet they don't have success. Why is that? Because they don't understand the culture part, and they don't understand authenticity. Okay, when Belichick first came to Cleveland, people said, well, you know, he's just an imitation of Bill Parcells. No, he never was. Look at Belichick. Does he look like he imitates anybody? He put a pair of scissors on him and he looks dangerous, right? That everything's cut off. <laughs> he's as authentic as everybody. I call it Sinatra in a laser suit. Most of these guys are like when Sinatra, you know, when you hear the word Frank Sinatra, you think of cufflinks, tuxedo, you know, and manicured hair, Right. What, when he was in a leisure suit with beads around his neck, that wasn't Sinatra. He was trying to be something he wasn't, and, he, and, he, and nothing sold. He couldn't sell an album. You have to be authentic as a leader. So take what Belichick does in his principles, and you put it into your own style and your own mannerisms. I think most of the guys that have left Bill have tried to duplicate Bill, and nobody can duplicate Bill. You can learn from Bill. You can't duplicate Bill. Do they duplicate, though, his, his approach to preparation and the game plans and so forth? I think they do, but again, remember, Bill's performing two jobs. So Bill's his head coach and is also his general manager. Most of these guys can't do two jobs. They can't do two jobs. It's really hard to do two jobs for them. So the GM might get the, might the GM coach might get the, of the coach might get the coach fired because he can't perform, or the coach might get the GM fired. They can't do both, and they try to duplicate that, and they don't understand really what makes Bill so unique and so special? His ability to evaluate, his ability to man from other people, his ability to, to develop talent. Secrets, there's a lot of secret sauce that goes up in New England, and the secret sauce is in what Belichick understands. The ability to see the future, the ability to look down the road and say, you know, we're going to have to play a goal line defense with three corners in it at some point during the year. And though, even though we may not run it until the final play of the 2014 season, we still need it and we practice it. That's foresight. So would, were they correct in getting rid of Jimmy Garoppolo? You know, I think that was one of those, you know, oftentimes I say to Belichick, Belichick makes sustainable decisions. He never makes solution-based decisions. I think that was one of the times that they really believed they could get Garoppolo extended to a contract. And because Don Yee represents both Tom Brady and Jimmy Garoppolo, I think that was a much more bigger challenge. And I think they would say that their quarterback of the future, they let him go. Do they have a quarterback of their future? No. So that's clearly the case. Are they all in now with Tom? Yeah. I think that becomes the biggest concern. So you told me, though, when we first had our, our first conversation and met, you told me that one of the things that Belichick does is he also coaches his coaches. Yes. And makes them better. Can you talk about that? Because leadership development is so important. Right. So most of these guys, nobody's, nobody's training coaches. So like what Belichick will do, because he wants young coaches that he can mold. He's not looking for new ideas. He's not looking for new plays. He's looking for you to implement what he wants. And then he's able to go coach you on the finer points of the game. You've never been, I've never been a part of any meeting where I've seen so many coaches take notes when he's coaching. When he's in the room, everybody's taking notes, talking about the game, talking about how he approaches it. His daily actions teaches coaches how to behave. And then his insight into the game also teaches them how to behave. And he'll take time to show the coaches what he needs done. There's nothing more important than winning the game. So he may say to Josh Porter, this week we're playing Marcus Mariota. He underthrows the ball. I want you to spend time on underthrowing balls. 
and every and, and what will happen at the end of the game, under throw balls will make a difference in the game. That's a teaching habit, right? It's teaching you the finer points of what really matters in the game and how you execute it. And, and he does it week in and week out. So people often talk about Tom Brady as the greatest and Belichick as the greatest. Would you say that they would be the greatest without each other? Like, the, would Tom Brady be great without Bill, Belichick? And would, would Belichick be as great without Tom Brady? Well, I think that it's the perfect marriage, right? I mean, it's the perfect partnership. Brady adheres to the culture. Brady wants that culture. Could Tom Brady survive in some other culture? I doubt it. I mean, not that he wouldn't be a great player, but, you know, could he go to a team that wasn't disciplined, that didn't have attention to detail? Could he, could he succeed? Whereas Belichick, part of his life is about that. You know, you say, well, he didn't win in Cleveland. Yeah, we did. We won, we won the last playoff game in 1994 with Vinny Testaverde, a quarterback. We did not have the greatest quarterbacks in Cleveland when we were there, but we were slowly building the culture there. And what happened was the owner didn't really want that culture. I used to say to Art Modell all the time, Art, you know, this, the program won't allow it. And he would say, what are you talking about the program? This is my team, you know? And he never could understand the difference. Whereas I think Belichick has to have an owner for him to be successful that allows him to install his culture. That's the bigger challenge in the NFL. And as you know, I read about positive leadership. Would, would Belichick be considered a positive leader? Well, you know, I think, I think there's, there's an element of Bill that he's constantly reverse engineering things. So he never really believes he has the perfect solution. He believes it's a game of adjustments. And when you believe that and you're not caught up in your own success, you're constantly striving for how to be better. And I think that's what he does. You might want to call it gloom and doom. I think he's always trying to get better. Uh, you know, his nickname is Doom by Parcells because he was down and gloomy. But I think that that negativity that he projects in terms of the analyzation, never to the team, but in terms of the analyzation and, and pushing the team to get better is really what makes the team better. And I think that that comes, that resonates. He's constantly in search of what do we have to do to win the game did we practice it in the, in, and in the first quarter, he's going to figure out what adjustments he has to make in order to prepare it. If he just sits there and says, don't worry, everything's going to be okay, that never happens. Is that gloom and doomy? Probably it might be, but it's realistic. Now, positive leaders actually always try striving to get better. So it's not about Pollyanna positive. They always want to get better, but they also have this optimism about belief. They do focus on challenges and how they can get better. But I, I think a key part is also the relationships they have with players. Does Bill have good relationships with his players? Yeah, I think he, I think he does, really, John, because I think the number one rule for Bill is being honest. Bill never lies to the players. Look, you, you know, I, I'm not going to – and he's forthright. When he stands in front of the team and says, look, it doesn't matter where you get drafted, it matters how you, how you play, he means it, and he backs it up. And when he admits a mistake in a draft pick, he shows vulnerability to the team. He's, he's willing to say, look, I made a mistake. I'm not keeping this guy who can't help us. I expect you to do the same thing. And I think that allows him to have a relationship with the players. Is it warm and fuzzy? I would say no. He's the leader. I mean, show me one leader that's hanging out with the troops and hang there's no leadership. That's a friendship. There's a difference. You know, it's I often say secretariat had a 22 length lead in, in the Preakness. The jockey was still hitting them on the butt. You know, the jockey was still hitting the greatest horse in the history of horse racing on the butt with a 22 length lead. Why? Because that's what you do when you lead. You have to keep striving for the best. Yeah, and he does challenge his team often. And I, I understand that guys that go there know what they're getting into. They know what the culture is about. They know that, hey, you're here to win. And if you're not winning, you can be gone tomorrow. Right. Everyone knows that they are there on a part-time basis if they don't perform well. So everyone understands the, the expectations, but it's not this uh, great loving kind of, well, it actually can be with a lot of the guys. They develop amazing relationships while they're there, but they're, they know that, hey, if they don't perform well, they're gone. Right. And I think, you know, look, fear does the work of reason, right? And so the players that go there realize that there is fear in the building and then there's reason in the building. And if you're not performing, whether you're a coach, whether you're a player, whether you're a staff member, you're going to be, you're not going to be part of the team. He's going to make sure he maintains and to maintain culture. You have to be diligent about that. If you let one link in the armor uh, go away, it can't. I mean, does the Navy SEALs like guys that can't get through the program into the SEAL program? Of course not. Right. That's why do they have so many helmets in the quad? 
It's just not for everybody. Going to play for New England is just not for everybody. You have to be really willing to do it. And if you're willing to do it and you're willing to sacrifice and you're mentally tough, which is defined by what's doing best for the team, which might not be best for you, you'll be successful. If it's about you, could Odell Beckham survive in New England? I would say no, because it's about Odell Beckham. You know, Odell Beckham wants to- Unless he conforms to the culture. And that's right. It would be a culture shock for him. And if he did, he would, be, he would probably be the best player he could possibly be. He's a great player today, but in a better culture, he would be better. Yeah, I believe that Belichick and Saban are outliers. They have a certain leadership style that would not work for almost anyone else in today's world. In today's world, you have to develop the relationship. You have to have a certain kind of level of, of connection with your players and team. And it is about optimism, belief. And I love the honesty part, but I don't think many people could do what they do today. If they would try it without having the credibility, right. having that culture built, they wouldn't succeed because people would be like, what? You just want that out of me? You're here to use me. That, you're not about developing me and, and caring about me. And that wouldn't work for a lot of teams. Am I correct on that? Yeah, I do. And I mean, I think Bill recognizes that so that we spent time talking about millennials. We had we had three day meetings going over how to approach millennials, how to reevaluate our evaluations of millennials. You know, I see a player as a white middle class man. I see I evaluate a player 30 years younger than me the way that I thought, think a player should. I can't think that way. I have to live in his generation to evaluate really what he means. And then once I can figure that out, I can properly evaluate the player. I do. I think success, obviously, and, and I don't know that it can be instant success because there is nothing instant that comes. But like Dabo Sweeney, I think Dabo Sweeney could come to the NFL and maybe go 5-11. and 11, And the next year he's going to be 11-5 and five because he's going to build a culture. And he's going to recruit the right players that fit the culture. That's what he does at Clemson. Why can't he do it in the NFL? Now you just nailed it. It's about love and accountability, having those two together, and then how you actually get those people to buy into your culture and you find the right people that, that fit your culture. So you're, saying, so you're saying then these leaders need to understand what their culture represents, what it stands for, to be able to find the right people. Right. If you have to, Bill Walsh taught me this in 1984. We're scouting inside out, not outside in. Some guys just can't fit this culture. And the more time we try to change them, we can't. Think about the greatest coach of all time. Coach Dale from Hoosiers, okay? Coach Dale practiced the law of threes better than anybody. The law of threes, there's three groups of people that you're evaluating. One that'll do anything you want them to do, that's group one. Two that are undecided, that's group two. And three, you can't make them happy. I mean, seriously, Odell Beckham just got $16 million a year and all this guaranteed money. Is he happy? Of course not. Okay, so what do you do as a leader, John? You instinctively try to influence group three. You think you can win over? If I went over group three, I'm going to bring everything over. What did Coach Dale do? He told Jimmy Chitwood if he didn't want to play, go ahead. I'll play with four. I'll play with three. It doesn't matter. I'll do whatever you want. It doesn't matter, right? And what did Jimmy Chitwood do? Because he was not getting any attention in group three, he moved into group one. He moved into group one himself. If you ignore group three – or you don't recruit players from group three, you're going to focus only on group one. And the strength of the team is in the team, not in the individual. And the more guys you have in group one, the better you'll be. Why do so many sports teams and organizations in general, and even companies bring in people that don't fit their culture? Because they don't always understand. They think they can change people, Mm -hmm. right? They think they can change them. B, and they also don't understand who they really are. They haven't defined what they spent time. It's not about mission statements. It's about who we are. Bill Walsh didn't walk into the San Francisco 49ers in 1979 and say, we're going to win a Super Bowl. He clearly laid out what he expected every organization member to be. 17 principles, standard of excellence. This is who we are. This is what we're going to be. And he went looking for people that adhere to that. Belichick does the same thing. Look at his coaching staff. It's always very highly smart guys, self-motivated, who have ideas, who can be divergent in thought and creative in thought, two important factors, different but important. And then he can grow those people. If you're set in your ways and you can't change, you're not going to survive in New England. Is Belichick evolving as a coach and as a leader? I think there's no doubt every day. I think he has evolved every day as a leader, as a coach, because he has to keep up with the times. And you also have to keep up with the kids. I mean, look, he's in his mid-60s. He's coaching kids way younger than him. But he's not up at like Bear Bryant. He's not up in the tower and not dealing with them. He's interacting with them on a daily basis. And, John, I believe this more than anything in my life. Intelligence creates followers. If the players realize you can make them better, if the players realize you're smart, 
whether you're 15 years old or you're 105 years old, they'll listen. But if you're 30 and you don't know anything, it does you no good. It does you no good. Or 60, or 60 and don't know anything. Exactly. It does you no good. And so you have to be able to constantly, there's two kinds of jobs you have in life. Jobs you can make a difference in and jobs you can grow from. And when you're in a job you can only grow from, you better water the plants every day and you better grow. You better read books every single day. You better work at your craft because you're going to get to a job that you can make a difference in. And if you're not prepared, you're going to fail. So what would you do if you're the leader of a, of a team and you know you need to develop the coaches within the organization? I'd spend time coaching them. I mean, I would spend time, I would spend, I would spend an hour, two hours each week. Forget about running to the next game. Let's focus on the last game we just played. Let's focus on what we did well, what we didn't do well. Let's do an autopsy on where we are right now. It's in the past that we learn from. How many leaders have you met that take over a company and the first thing they talk about is the first 100 days? Okay, they talk about the first 100 days. Right. Nobody, talks about the, nobody talks about the reason you got the job, right? Yes, if that's great. Spend, if you spend time on the last 100 days and figure out why, you, why you're in this job, you can solve the problems for the next 100 days. But if we always constantly look ahead, so that's the same thing happens in the NFL. After a game, you should spend all of Monday understanding why you won, why you lost, and how do you get better. That's what Mondays are for. And so for me as a leader, that's what we should do. After a draft, John, you should spend as much time on the draft preparation. You should spend another week on the evaluation of your draft. Instead of sitting there shaking everybody's hand saying you had a good draft, let's reverse engineer it and figure out why we messed this up or what we could do better. That's how you get better. Yeah, that's, that's great insights for, for any organization. Really yeah. powerful. I mean, in terms of you're saying just continue to get better, continue to learn, learn from the past so that you can continue to get better for the future. Who else is doing it right right now in the NFL? Well, I think Pete Carroll. I mean, well, you know, Pete Carroll went to Seattle. And he said, you know, I'm going to be my own man. I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to, I'm, st- I'm not going to be, I mean, when he went to USC, excuse me, I'm not going to be the Pete Carroll from the Jets. I'm not going to try to be an imitation of somebody else. I'm not going to be Pete. I'm going to be authentic. And I think Pete Carroll got back to his roots. I think Pete Carroll gets it. Is his team great? No, I think he's doing one of his best coaching jobs in football. I think he gets it. I think Sean McVay has developed and he showed that he's vulnerable in the sense that he let, hires an experienced defensive coordinator and allows him to have some standard. Years ago, when I first got in the league, somebody told me this. There were four great coaches that got hired, great coordinators that got hired. Mike Ditka, John Makovic, Dan Henning, and Dan Reeves. And two of those guys failed. Makovic and Henning failed because they could never get one side of the ball. They could never get the right help they needed that complemented what they did. Reeves had, had, had uh, Joe Collier to help coach defense and helped him. And Dicta had Buddy Ryan, which helped him. And so I think that's the biggest mistake. We don't know what our weaknesses are that we can add people to help us with that area. You mentioned Pete Carroll. He has Tell the Truth Mondays every Monday with the team where they go over what went wrong, how they can get better, and everyone's open to that feedback. He's established that as part of the culture. Right. What do you think about that idea of tell the truth? I love it. I think it's great. I think, I think it shows vulnerability. And, and coaches have to be accountable. How many programs have you walked into where the coaches are saying, we, we're horrible, we're lousy, we have no talent? That's what's going on in Oakland right now. All they're doing is blaming the lack of talent. Walsh would have never allowed that. Walsh would, once you start blaming the players, you're basically absolving yourself. They resent you. They hate you for it. You've got to – everybody's – have you ever heard Belichick say we lost the game because the, the, the right guard or like what happened to Vance Joseph, Brandon McManus missed, missed the kick? Of course not. we got to do a better job coaching. You know, it's never one play that costs you the game. It's always the play before or two plays. And so, yeah, I love that. I think anytime you can be critical of yourself, you're going to grow. And, look, we're in a profession where one-third of the workforce gets fired every single year. So if you're not spending time on what you messed up, you're wrong. And if you're not spending time on what other teams messed up on, like I did a project for Belichick after we won a Super Bowl. He wanted me to go over organizations throughout the league that were doing really good and write up what they did well, what they didn't do well, and study them. And what can we learn from? Who does that? The guy's got five Super Bowl rings. But that's what he's trying to get to, right? That's what makes him great. And you mentioned Sean McVay. He's young, but he is smart, talented, has learned the defense, spent time really learning the defense, just like you said, Bill, Bill Belichick knows everything about 
game plan, every part of the offense, defense, special teams. Sean as well has, has taken that study to understand that. I think that shows a lot of respect to for his teams and for all the players that he knows those things. No doubt. But what do you see in terms of his growth as a leader? What else will he need to do to, to rise, rise the, the growth as a leader? I think he's just got to continue to keep, object, keep his eyes open. I think he's got to keep learning. I think he should spend time trying to figure out where the game's going in the next level. And I think – I love this quote after the Saints game. I think that he got punched in the mouth yesterday and they were going to learn from it. And I think they needed that. And I think he's got to be open to – and I think he's really humble. And I think his humbleness allows him to grow. He doesn't – even though he's brilliant and he knows everything, he doesn't think he knows it all. And I think he's going to become a better leader in 10 years than he is today. Can you tell when a coach is going to be successful or not? I think you can. I think you can. But look, Nick Saban, the first day he was on the field at Baldwin Wallace College, and we were practice, that's where we practiced at the Browns, you knew he was a great coach. You could tell he had a command. You know, he had a command. And he had a, an ability to, to evaluate. He had an ability to really understand the whole game. I think you can. I think coaches today try to focus too much on – just their area of expertise and not seeing the future. And that's a hard thing to do, but I think you can, I think you can see the leadership. It's, you know, it's what I call the command of the room guys that can command the room. You can see that right away. How they do it is always different. And guys that can command the message and the way they explain it is always different, but you can see it quickly. Do you see what's going on with the Jaguars right now in terms of, uh, you know, a divide between coaches and players? Is that something that can be solved? Can you heal that? I think the problem there, John, is this. I think there can be only one voice in any organization. I think, you know, I love Tom Coughlin, and I think Tom's a really good football man. I think, to me, the job of an NFL general manager is in the background. I think he works for the coach. Even if he has the authority above the coach, he should work for the coach. There has to be one voice. Anytime there's more than one voice and the players think they work for somebody other than the coach, you have chaos. And I think that's the problem. And I think the real issue is they don't know how to handle success. I mean, Jalen Ramsey saying what he says would never have happened in New England. You can't have that. you got to speak for yourself. Don't speak about someone else. And so I think that's really what, what, which is important. Do the Falcons have a great culture? I think Dan Quinn's trying to build one. I think there's a disconnect between – I think Thomas Dimitrov runs the team. He picks the players. I think Quinn's trying to develop his own culture. I think they're trying to find a harmony between the two. But I don't know if the Falcons are diverse enough in how they procure talent. They only rely on the draft solely. Maybe some sprinkle free agents, but they're not, they don't claim players off the waiver wire. They don't steal guys. They're not divergent in thought. So I think that's a challenge. They're different than Seattle. I find you have to have alignment between the owner, the GM, and the coach. What are your thoughts on that? I think the owner's got to set the philosophy, right? And he's got to set it and he's got to say, my organization, I don't want players that do this. I want, a, I want a team that does that. I want a basketball team that plays up and down tempo. I want a football team that scores points. Whatever it is, it doesn't matter. And then he takes a step back. Hire a coach and a GM to unify themselves together to put that plan into place. That's the most important thing. Where can we go without a plan? We have to have a plan. And if the owner's not going to give us to us what we want, then we're subjected to subcontracting. That doesn't work. And I think that's the biggest – that's where owners make a mistake. Owners are told every single day football is not like any other business, right? And it's a lie. It's like every other business. You have to play that way exactly. And if you don't, you're going to make mistakes. Yeah, I find a lot of times coaches will bring me in to speak to a team, but the GM and the owner have no understanding about culture. Not care about culture, don't think about culture, don't build culture. And you look at the Steelers and you see how they've had such a great culture and continuity, uh, two coaches right in the last number of years, and sustained success over time. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I think this. Okay, so when you evaluate an organization, the teams that know what they're doing, that have a culture, then they can evaluate. Because football teams don't talk to you. I said this in the book. You're in the veterinarian business. It's either players, coaches, or schemes when your team breaks down. The team doesn't say, you know, we have bad schemes or we have bad coaches. So when you have a really good scheme and you have really good coaches, it just comes down to players, right? And so when you have a culture and you can figure out where your culture is, you can solve your problems. We have the wrong players in the culture. We don't. The Raiders, for example, do they have any idea what it, they think it's all just players? 
we need better players. All you hear out of Oakland today is we need better players. When in reality, I think they need a better culture. When in reality, they might need better schemes. So the way to solve the problem is to eliminate two of those three, have great coaches, have great schemes, have a culture, and then just make it all about improving the talent base. Are owners asking you right now to help them with their culture? Because if I'm an owner, I'm calling you saying, help me with my GM, help me with the culture, help me to establish this. How I've many had, call I've you? had several calls from basketball teams in the NBA. I've had no calls from NFL teams. I'm not sure anybody in the NFL has read the book. I really don't. <laughs> I think everybody in the NFL would look at the book and say, you know, we do that. That's no big deal. You know, the NFL is, the, the NFL is not about natural learning. I don't think people do it. It, bl it blows my mind because if I'm following you on Twitter and I read your tweets, I'm calling you tomorrow. Kurt Warner has offered to help any quarterback in the NFL, and he says no one takes him up on his offer. It blows my mind that, that he and you, that you two both have incredible knowledge, wisdom, success, and yet people don't call. It's amazing. You know, the only coach who calls me in the league is Belichick. <laughs> And on a regular basis, but, but it's funny. Oh, and there's one other coach that calls, but, but I think, but nobody's really read the book or said, Hey, come in basketball teams have, but no, no, it's fascinating. And, you know, and I would do it, but like, look, I've spent my whole life. I think I'm a fairly good expert on knowing Bill Belichick. You would think the teams that you would think the teams that compete against them would have had me come in and talk to them about the Patriot way, you know, I mean, my son works for the Jets. I've yet – I don't even get invited to Jet practices. <laughs> <laughs> it's unbelievable. Yeah, it, it blows my mind that they would not call you. They need help with their culture big time. Yeah, I don't think people see it that way. I think most personnel guys see we just need better players. They don't they don't see realize, yeah, they don't, they don't realize that culture is what drives talent towards greatness. Right. right. They're like the FBI. They're like the FBI who's going through the through – the, uh, the, the, the phone book looking for serial killers. Like they actually think that's what they do, you know, and, and nobody, nobody wants to admit somebody does it better than they do. That's just human nature. Right. But the ones that do would want to help. Like I'm kind of, like, I want to learn something new. Like George Raveling, our friend, one of the greatest human beings of all time, 81 years old. He still asks me questions. I don't know as much as coach Rav, but he's always asking questions and I'm learning stuff from him more than he's ever learned anything from me, but he's curious beyond belief. And he's getting asked. Basketball coaches are much more curious about than football coaches. I mean, there's, I mean, Matt Rule at Baylor, my son coaches at Baylor. He's constantly talking to me. But I would think I would have had more college coaches call me, but I haven't had any. Really? And I've sent some college coaches the book. But they're probably not reading it. Uh, you know, you can't help somebody who doesn't want to be helped. I mean, I, I'm not saying I have all the answers because God knows I don't. I'm trying to learn as well, too. But I think there's some things that I could help with. No, no, no doubt. I get those. I, mean, I haven't even spoke to a college team yet. Really? No, I haven't spoke to a college team yet, and I'm hoping to do that, John. I'm hoping to do it because I think I think I could help. I think I could help coach coaches. And well, I, know, I know you could. I know you could. That's why I wanted to interview you because I know how much wisdom you bring and insights you have, and I know how many people would benefit from that. I get the calls from coaches, but there's always those few that call, that reach out, that want to be better. And sometimes, actually not even sometimes, often, they're the best coaches in the games. I find that the best are always striving to get better. And you just seem to nail that with Bill Belichick and those that are calling you. Yeah, I mean, it's just, it's just I think people are jealous. They don't want to learn from something. When, when what's the best way to learn something is to admit you don't know. You know, Judge Scalia, the great Supreme Court justice who passed away, has a great line. He says, wisdom comes later. When he made a decision that wasn't right, he said, well, wisdom came later. Like, there's nothing wrong with wisdom coming later. Like, you don't have all the answers, right? Like, wisdom will come later to all of us. I mean, I'm going to be better tomorrow than I am today. You know, I'm going to know the NFL better tomorrow than I am today. But if I don't stop working at it, but if you don't want to get improved, I don't see how you're going to do it. The guy in New England has been to seven conference championship games in a row. That's a better record than Joe DiMaggio's 56-game hitting streak. I mean, do you realize how hard it is to be a Final Four team in the NFL? And yet he's dominating that. Like, instead of being jealous and saying they get all the calls, why don't you just admit that, you know, they got something going on there. Can we steal that secret sauce? Jimmy Haslam asked me almost once a month and said, what makes a great owner? I would answer the question he would ask me the next month. And I give him the same answer. You know, and yet he's incapable of understanding what it's going to take to win because he's constantly looking for more advice. Like, we're, this isn't a diet pill. 
that I'm going to look, if I could take a diet pill and lose 50 pounds, I'd be, I'd be the first guy to do it. Right. It's hard work. It takes, it takes commitment and it takes 1% better every day. Not everybody's willing to do it. Will the Cleveland Browns going back to the beginning now of our conversation, will they have a good future with Baker Mayfield? Well, look, I think that's the problem. They're, they're banking their future on a player. What players ever led a team to the great, to the champ, to one thing? It takes a culture. It takes a village, right? And so, yeah, I think Baker Mayfield's a great player. I love Baker Mayfield. I think Baker Mayfield gives them life. But if they don't have a leader, if they don't have a comprehensive program, and it can't come from John Dorsey, because John Dorsey now, look, let's be real honest here. John Dorsey will take players that have some off-the-field issues. Andy Reid worked through them. Tyreek Hill, we all know it's documented. You know, Travis Kelsey, those are about, they worked through them there. Okay. If Andy Reid wasn't willing to take that on, would John Dorsey have been as effective as he was? I doubt it. So whoever the next coach is, is going to be able to have to understand that. that he takes Callaway, who misses a whole season at, at, at Florida. You got to be willing to take that on. Can you develop? Does that player fit the program? I think there comes the disconnect. Do the Browns have that worked out yet? I don't think so. But if you have the right culture, you can take on that player. Correct. Develop that player. But you've got to establish the culture first. Right. That's why the Patriots take on Josh Gordon. They know that he's walking into a place that the players are going to discipline him as much as the coaches. I was thinking about that. Josh Gordon all of a sudden is thriving in New England, but yet couldn't thrive in Cleveland. And it just showed- he had no rules. Nobody told him what to do. Nobody told him what to expect. Nobody gave him an outline on here's what you're going to do. It's taken him three weeks to get in shape in New England. He wasn't even in conditioning. I mean, when he got there, his eyes had to open up wide and say, oh, my God, I've never experienced this before in my life. So this is what being a great team is all about. This is what a real culture looks like. Correct. It's so simple, and yet we miss it. We don't want to pay attention to it, John. I mean, it's just it's so clear. It's like you talk about it. We don't want to pay attention to it. We think we're going to take a pill, and it's going to wake up tomorrow. I mean, look, the Giants have been owned by the same family for forever. And yet they're behaving as if they've never operated in this way before. Because remember this, change is hard for most people. And like Eric Shininsky says, if you don't like change, you're going to like irrelevance even less. They become irrelevant because their inability to change. People don't search for solutions. They're not looking to get better. They want to keep doing the same thing and they wonder why they're not winning. So is keeping Eli another year a mistake? Of course it was. Hardest thing to do in any sport is evaluate your own player. Look, Eli's a great player. His name's going to go on the wall of fame in the Giants stadium. They owe everything to the Super Bowls. But, again, you have to be honest with yourself. And what they did was hire people to support their already conclusion. You never in scouting can begin with the end in mind. So if I begin with the end in mind and I believe that this player is great, I'll ask people to tell me that he's great. New England's going to ask the opposite. Why is this player, you know, should we get rid of How long Do you think Eli would have still been on the Patriots this year? No. When do they let Tom Brady go? At, at what point does that happen? I think when he declines playing. I mean, look, when I, when, when I showed up in 2014, he, Tom was coming off not a great season. You know, they were a running team. LeGarrette Le Blunt carried him into the Final Four, and Tom missed some throws. He wasn't ha- – and they didn't have great receivers. And the first four games of the 14th season, people were writing, maybe Tom's not ready. And all of a sudden, we played that game against Cincinnati, and Tom has, and Tom has become better. Philip Rivers is having an MVP season beyond his own comprehension. I mean, he's, had, he's 20 points higher than his career average right now in, in quarterback rating. 20 points. So, you know, he's gotten better. But when Why, is that? Him, Why is he 20 points higher? Because I think he's got better players around him now. And he's better. But when you perform at a level like he does, and you're constantly – improving like he has been you're going to keep getting better and you can see when he's not look at the difference between Eli Manning and Philip Rivers just this year alone one guy can't throw the ball down the field the other guys make it throws all the way down the field so if you look at the Green Bay Packers they made the right decision by going with Aaron Rodgers and moving away from Brett Favre knowing that he only had a few years left right Manning same thing in Indianapolis with Andrew Luck right so they made the decision to upgrade to or not even upgrade but to bring on a a new, uh, a new model, right? right? They, they innovated. It's called disruptive innovation, right? right. You get rid of your old model, create a new model f- to have future success. And then you look at the Giants, they did not go to a new model. They kept the old model and now they're struggling. Right. And if they just would open up the, when they open up their browser and see Amazon, Jeff Bezos, that's all he cares about is re- recreating everything every single day. 
he'll just reinvent something every day. That's part of the world today we live in. You, as you said, you know, it's hard for Nick and Bill to coach today's players. It's the same way you have to operate in business. If you're, if you're so stuck to your ways, Bezos isn't. You know, if he was, he'd still be selling books out of his, out of his garage, right? He right. tears down everything every single day and rebuilds it. He, he's looking forward to tearing it down. And if you're not trying to do that in the NFL, you're not getting better. So one final question I have to ask you about, because I uh, wrote a book with Mike Smith, you win in the locker room first. I've been wanting to ask someone this for a while of your expertise. Coached five years with the Falcons. They never won back-to-back -back, uh, winning seasons before him as a coach, right? Never had back-to-back -back winning seasons. And then they had five incredible years, two down years. We know the drafts were not very good. We know that he had a lot of injuries, not a lot of players. And I felt like the Falcons should not have gotten rid of him at that point because, again, two down years, but didn't have the players around him to be successful. The Steelers, I believe, would have kept him, right. rallied around him, made some tweaks, and then continued to improve because that's what their culture dictates. Instead, they said, let's get rid of the coach, trying to act like the coach was the problem. Mike will never say that, but this is my standpoint, having really evaluated, watching this, talked to other people who saw and knew that they didn't have much talent on that team, and yet – they got rid of him, brought in Dan Quinn. Dan Quinn's a great guy, great coach. But was that the right decision from a cultural perspective as an organization that wants to have a great culture? Because I think they can't evaluate their, they couldn't evaluate their own team. They're not going to be honest. You know, they're not going to, because again, the dynamic is the general manager has the players. There's a passage in my book where Walsh is talking about a, 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 a dinner that the owner has with the general manager and the player personnel director and how everything's the coach's fault. That's, that, was a, that was a fable in the book that I wrote about that, Bella, that Walsh talked about. It's still true today. And so we tend to blame the coaches all the time. And when I'm here as a personnel guy, I'm telling you that, yes, sometimes the coaches are at fault, but most, most of the time it's the players are at fault or there's something wrong with your system. Where's your system breaking down? If you have a leak, it isn't just always in one spot. It's called false duality. It's not A or B. Get rid of the coach, get a new coach. You have to circumvent and find all different avenues. And I would agree. Look, I think it's – this is a Belichickian thing. You fire a coach, you have to retrain somebody else. If you make the coach better – he becomes what you want him to be. But if you never talk to him about it, you can't. I agree with you. You agree on that? Yeah, I do. And I, I think he's a better head coach than he is a coordinator. I mean, right, and I think if he's willing to learn and be adaptive and he's not resistant to change, then you've got a chance. Because, look, everybody, the alternative is, what are you going to do? You fire John Harbaugh tomorrow, who are you hiring? I was thinking the same thing. I was thinking the same thing. If you get rid of him, who are you going to bring in that's going to be a bring in? coach? Yeah, now, bring in somebody to help John Harbaugh. Bring in somebody to say, okay, you, maybe you need a new chief of staff. Maybe you need a new this or something else to give you new ideas. You know, let's change this a little bit. But if he's not adapted to change, now you've got to make this. Like, like, they're sitting there with Lamar Jackson. They drafted him in the first round. Marty Morningwig is fighting tooth and nail to put him in the game. He just runs trick plays with him. Like, the time should be we've got to get him in the game. This is where Belichick would be so much different. He would see Lamar Jackson's talent at practice every day, and he would tell Morningwig, we need him in the game. And that leadership skill right there is what separates Bill from everybody else. When we see what Jack Del Rio did with the Raiders, does that make him a good coach or a bad coach? Because it seemed like he had more success with, you know, again, the same thing with the Jaguars. Like, after he left, was fired, the Jaguars had years and years of – of, of a lack of success. I think Gus Bradley's a great coach, by the way. But then the same thing happened with the Raiders now. I think, I, think Jack, I think Jack did a good job of being able to hide the problems. I think the problems have come out completely now. And, and, and I think when you look at Gus Bradley, I think Gus Bradley's probably really – I think there's a difference between a manager and a leader, right? Leaders do the right thing. Managers do things right. And so, leader, there, there's a difference between the two. And who can do the right thing is the coach that knows what it's going to take to win the title and how he has to prepare his team. And then he tells the managers how to do it. So, there's leadership, there's management, there's coaching, there's developing leaders, all the things that you said Bill Belichick did. That's what he does. In closing, I know I said I was gonna, that was my last question, but one more. Was, was Bill Walsh the greatest leader you've seen, or is it Bill Belichick? I, well, I mean, Belichick's doing it without a cap. With a cap, that's really hard. He's managing the financial district down in the locker room. That's a challenge. Putting culture, putting money away is hard. But Walsh was brilliant at it. I mean, Walsh was, Walsh was much more about the standard of principles of excellence than he was the West Coast offense. And Walsh was about teaching coaches. 
and Walsh was to me, there's, a, there's not a day, John, in my life that I don't think about something Bill Walsh taught me. Not a day. In fact, when I'm in this house here and there's a picture that's not straight, I'm going to go straighten it out. I mean, Walsh was incredible. His brilliance of seeing the game ahead of time was magnificent. And Belichick, to me, um, I mean, Belichick, I'm, just, I'm closer. I was probably more aware and I could learn more because I was at least educated to understand Bill. When I first learned from Coach Walsh, I knew nothing. I was a blank tape. And when you're a blank tape, you're taking everything in. By the time I got with Belichick, I knew a little bit, so I could take even more in. What do you hope that people get from your book, Gridiron Genius, and what are you excited about going forward? I hope every high school coach in any sport reads the book. I want to make better coaches. I want to make better leaders. I hope Wall Street reads the book. I hope if you lead anybody, I think you read the book, you can learn something from it. The book is not about football. The book's about leadership. The book's about, the book is about all things that matter. That in terms of business, and my dogs, I apologize. <laughs> you got some great dogs there. Yeah, they, they're Italian. They love the bark. They, they the bark. <laughs> so, yeah, so the book really will help any leader be a better. I think it is. I think it's baseball coaches, women's volleyball. I want women's basketball coaches to read the book. I want this book to be on every high school coach's uh, bedroom st- reading at night because I think there's so many lessons you can learn from what I've been so part of, not from me, but from my experiences. This is not a book about Michael Lombardi. This is a book about what I've learned. Michael Lombardi, thank you so much for what you're sharing and what you continue to share. Thank you, John. I appreciate it. You're the greatest. Thank you. 